Come join us in Denver, Colorado, October 14th, 15th, and 16th, 2011 for the best high-end headphone audio show in the world, the third annual Can Jam at Rocky Mountain Audio Fest. To find out more about Can Jam at RMAF, go to www.canjam.org. On this episode of HeadFi TV, we're going to be talking about two really unusual products, really exotic products from Japan. Both products are made by the same designer and manufacturer. The designer's name, I only know him by Mr. Take. And the company's called Take T. And the first of the two products is this. It's the Take T BPP. It is a super tweeter for headphone listening. And the second product is the Take T H2 Plus. It's a polymer piezoelectric Heil type driver headphone. Again, two very unusual pieces, and they're what we'll be talking about on this episode of HeadFi TV. Now, if you browse HeadFi regularly, you may have noticed the ad banner for the Take-T BPP and wondered what it is. Um, well, again, it's a super tweeter for headphone listening. And the idea behind it is, is that Mr. Take believes that we are sensitive to ultrasonic frequencies through the skin on our faces. And uh, that's where the frequency response of the BPP starts. It actually starts at the upper limit of human hearing, or 20 kilohertz, and then goes up to 150 kilohertz. Now, on the website, on BP, I'm sorry, on, the, on Take T's website, uh, Mr. Take recommends that you perform a test to see if you're a candidate for the BPP. And that test is rather simple, and I've done it many times. It involves, and I wear glasses, so I'd take my glasses off if you wear glasses, but it involves putting the palms of both your hands over your face while listening to music or television through loudspeakers, uh, or even, as Mr. Take puts it, to birds or cicadas outside. If while listening to these things and you put your hands over your face, the sound, as he puts it, dims, um, then you may be a candidate for the BPP. I imagine, uh, uh, I, I believe it said that the, the more the effect, the more pronounced the effect, uh, the more the effect of the BPP should be evident to you. Now, I have done the test and um, several times again, and I do notice a difference in sound. Now, what I don't know is if the difference in sound is actually caused by, as Mr. Take believes, um, blocking the ultrasonic sound uh, to the skin of my face, or if it's caused simply by changing the acoustics of my head. Um, I'm not sure, but again, I've done the test several times, and, and I did notice a difference. Uh, so you might try doing that test as well. Now, installation of the BPP and how to use it, very straightforward, very simple. It comes with everything you need, including a splitter and a right angle uh, adapter, in case you need a right angle to get the BPP pointed in the general direction of your face. You simply plug the BPP with or without the right angle adapter into one side of the splitter. You plug your headphones into the other side of the splitter. Then you plug the splitter into the headphone output of your iPhone, iPod, or whatever else you're using, portable amp. And then you orient it so that the BPP is pointed in the general direction of your face. That is simply how you use it. It's just that straightforward. According to Take-T, you don't need to point this exactly at your face. If it's generally pointed in the direction of your face, I believe he, it says even if it's on your lap, generally pointing up at your face, then you should experience the effect. And that's how you use the BPP. Now, of course, the most important question is, does the BPP work? Or at the very least, did it work for me? Now, I've tried it in several rigs. I've tried it uh, out of an iPod and iPhone 3GS directly. I've tried it in an iPod Fostex HBP1 rig. Uh, I've tried an iPod Cypher Labs Algorithm Solo Ray Samuels Audio SR71B rig. And out of any of those rigs so far, the BPP hasn't worked for me. I haven't experienced the intended effect or benefit of the BPP. Now, what that effect or benefit is, it's supposed to improve imaging, make it more three-dimensional, move the image forward more, if I understand the website correctly. It's supposed to improve the resolution uh, across the frequency band. And uh, I just haven't experienced the effect. Uh, now, I do encourage you, because it's priced at 3,700 yen, which I believe today translates to $48. Um, so it's not terribly expensive. I encourage you, if you're curious, to try it. If you did the face, the, the palm cover face test, and uh, you had a really pronounced effect in doing that, uh, then you might be interested in trying the BPP. Again, it's not terribly expensive, and you might have better luck with it than I did. The second of the two Take-T products that we'll be talking about today is right up here on top of my head. It's the H2 Plus headphone. And you can see by looking at it on my head that it looks very unique. But it's not just its looks that are strange. The whole thing from inside out is unlike any other headphone I've ever used or seen in my life or heard. Um, let's start with the drivers. 
The main drivers are Heil type polymer piezoelectric drivers. It's a pleated uh, piezoelectric type driver. And on the outside of each earpiece is a super tweeter, uh, very similar to the BPP that we talked about in the first segment. So again, the driver complement, unlike any I've ever seen on a headphone. The design again, also strange and unique. Let's compare it to a more traditional headphone, a popular headphone like the Sennheiser HD650. You can see that the H2 Plus is quite a bit larger. And it also doesn't have the typical sizing mechanism that you'll see on most headphones, which is kind of pulling the earpiece up and down to adjust the length of the headband. You don't do that with this. They're fixed in that, they're fixed in the vertical plane. You adjust it in the horizontal plane only at the top of the headband, uh, you, all you're doing is adjusting width. So again, uh, very unique design with respect to the sizing mechanism. For comfort, you'll find these uh, hand-shaped, it looks like, wire loops. And all they do is cushion the headphone on top of your head. They're covered in what looks like hand-stitched leather and heat shrink tubing uh, to finish off the seams. So that gives it a sort of uh, DIYer, um, mad audio scientist appearance. Uh, 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 and that's what the whole headphone sort of looks like. It almost looks more like an audio experiment. But don't let me mislead you into thinking that it's built poorly. It's actually built quite well, despite its uh, sort of audio mad scientist appearance. But it is, again, in every way, inside to out, um, a very unique headphone. Now, another thing that makes the H2 Plus unlike most headphones is the fact that you don't drive it out of a standard headphone output. You won't be plugging these into your iPod, for example. Um, it, it needs to be driven from speaker outputs using this, the TR2, which you buy separately from Take-T. And you essentially plug your speaker outputs into the binding posts on the back of the TR2, and then you plug the H2 Plus into the front of the TR2. To adjust volume, you use your preamplifier, your integrated amplifier, whatever you use to adjust volume on your loudspeaker outputs is what you'd use to adjust the volume on the H2 Plus. That's pretty much what you need to drive these things. Now. A lot of people will obviously consider that a disadvantage because um, you have to use, again, loudspeaker outputs. And that can be uh, rather inconvenient, say, for example, for a desktop setup. But that's just what it needs. Now, let's talk about the price uh, because this is kind of an expensive system, to say the least. That the TR2 is priced at 100,000 yen, which I believe is about uh, $1,300 in today's dollars. And the H2 Plus is 153,000 yen, which puts it at about $1,990. So together, the system's about um, $3,300, so it's quite expensive. So yes, the H2 Plus with its TR2 transformer box is a pretty expensive pairing, but is it worth it? Um, well, that's what we'll be talking about here when we talk about its performance. Now, I want to revisit its design to talk about fit because it has a, a really big impact on sound. Um, I think it's something to do with the uh, piezoelectric type drivers, or at least this specific type of driver design. It tends to beam. It's very directional uh, with the sound. Um, so it's very then sensitive to where it is on your head or relative to your ears. So it took a lot of experimenting for me to kind of get it to where I knew it sounded best for me. And I don't think there's any single way to wear it or best way to wear it. The instructions, at least from what I could tell, don't really spell out one great way to wear it. I think you're just going to have to adjust it till, you, till it sounds best to you. Now for me, it sounds best when the headband is at its widest setting and when I have the earpieces tilted like this. And at that point, it's just dangling really off the top of my head. I do a little bit of adjustment to get the sound right this way. And once I have it locked in, that's when it sounds its best. I think some people, for example, will probably want it a little tighter. It'll sound its best tighter with the earpieces snugged in a little bit more against the head. I don't know, but for me, this is how it works best. And uh, so fit with this headphone, given the, the very directional nature of the drivers, um, is, is critical. Now, when it comes to discussing the H2 Plus's overall performance, its overall sound um, and sound quality, I want to reference quickly a review that was posted in 2007 by a longtime head fire named Doug. He goes by Dougie on the forums. And I'm going to include that review in the thread uh, for this uh, video on head fire. But in that review, Dougie comes to the conclusion that it might be the best headphone in the world, uh, quite possibly the best headphone he'd ever heard, and he's heard a lot of headphones. Now, while I'm not as enthusiastic about the H2 as he is, I can totally see where he's coming from. I love these headphones. Um, because the things that, it, that, that the H2 Plus does well, it does so very well. But the thing is, it requires a lot of work to get there, so I need to mention that. Um, there's some peakiness and troughiness with this that, uh, that needs to be EQ'd, at least for me and the way I set them up and for my preferences. Uh, example, 
upper mid bass, upper bass range, I find myself toning it down fairly frequently with an equalizer. I use the uh, parametric equalizer in Sonic Studio's Amara software, by the way. And um, I find myself, again, using the equalizer with these headphones more than any other headphones. Despite that, though, even with the work, the outcome can be really, really rewarding. And Dougie touches on this in his review. Well, he does more than touch on it. He really uh, covers this extensively. It has a physicality to it, a tactility to it, that no other headphone I've heard uh, has. Uh, and we've heard headphones that have good, solid bass, tactile bass, um, a sense of solidity down there. But it must be particular to the driver type. This has, it conveys physicality, tactility across the audio band. So in the mids, you got, you've got vocals, human vocals that it, it's like the voice is there physically with you. I don't mean outside the head um, uh, uh, imaging or anything like that, but I mean like there's a physical voice there yeah, and, 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 and instruments, again, across the audio band, not just in bass. And it does it better than any other headphone, and it's, it's actually quite remarkable. So the, the sound stage is uh, almost diffuse, wider, uh, not super diffuse or too diffuse, but it's, it's, it's wider probably because of the way it physically sits on my head. But the images within that soundstage, solid. Uh, uh, across the audio band, phenomenal. And that's its strength. Um, so, I really love these headphones. I'm going to miss them a great deal when they're gone. Do I recommend them? Not really. Not, certainly not to your everyday head fire. Um, uh, I will recommend them with a certain type of head fire, but not your everyday head fire. They're just too much work, and they're very expensive. So loudspeaker output, you need the transformer box, 3300 bucks, um, and a lot of work. However, I will recommend them unequivocally for that connoisseur type head fire, and we have a lot of those guys on head fire. They have pretty much every headphone ever made, always on the lookout for something new and unique, and they have the disposable income to have pretty much head every headphone ever made. For those guys, Highly recommend they try the H2 Plus. I think they would find something very unique in it. I guarantee you, if they don't have an H2 Plus in their collection already, then they've never heard anything like it or if they've never heard it before. So for that kind of head fire, I recommend it unequivocally, but not as a general recommendation on head fire. Too much work, too expensive, loudspeaker outputs. So anyways, that's the H2 Plus, an entirely unique product. I love it. I'm going to miss it when it's gone. This is Head Fi TV, and we'll see you next time.